first off, wasn't wasn't Paul's session great? He just did a, he just packed in so much stuff. Uh, just a couple of fun comments. You know, I we, I did a disc survey early in my career. Um, it's interesting. I, I didn't realize this about disc, but it's behavioral, not personality, which means your disc profile could change. And it was funny. I went through a change that really upset me because I kind of liked where I started. <laughs> I didn't like who I became. But um, when I first time I took it, I was like kind of off the charts, DC. And they, they, they come up with these, like, what would be your perfect career if you're off the charts, DC? And mine was assassin. <laughs> you know, he will plan your murder. He will do it meticulously. And he will do it definitively and deadly <laughs> for all the Ds. And, and I absolutely hated eyes because they were just kind of, you know, <laughs> you know, they were, you know, the salespeople, you know, oh, I love that dress. You don't love that dress. You're just saying you love that dress. And, and so I hated eyes. And then later, Mike and I were doing it with, with, with our group. And I took it again. And I was still high D, but really high I. I was like, oh, <laughs> I've become who I hate. <laughs> but pretty cool. And the other neat anecdotal thing, you know, I, thank you for doing that tribute to, you know, 9-11. Uh, I actually worked in uh, World Trade Center 2 on 26th floor early in my career as a um, software developer for Wall Street in trading. And so that's pretty emotional because I could have been in that building. I mean, we were long gone doing other things by then, but um, I worked there. And they're not there anymore. And that's, that's a really kind of eerie thing. Um, so first off, I'm Roland Thompson. Um, I'm the Thompson part of Thompson and Blackstone. And you're going to hear just some, some, some anecdotal, you know, um, lessons from a couple of entrepreneurs. Um, I list two business here. There, there have been many. Those were the two most significant uh, but we've we've been involved in another number of businesses. Um, Skycam, which some of you may have heard of. You guys, football, watch. You ever heard of Skycam? Okay, that that was one of our businesses. And, and Frontline Education, they're kind of the bookends of kind of what we do. We have divested of those businesses now, and uh, we we actually uh, Thompson Blackstone uh, does investment, and we're maybe like a you know, private equity or a venture capital uh, organization, but we look at different investments, mostly tech investments, but um, uh, we've, we've lately here have done some other things in real estate and car washes and some <laughs> weird other stuff. But uh, uh, we've, we've done a lot of things. And, you know, if I had more time, I'd, you know, tell you how we started was, you know, our first concept we were pursuing was a pet crematorium. And, you know, we <laughs> just diverse kinds of things uh, that we got involved in. And we had a vision, both Mike and I came from 10 year prior careers in corporate America, way different backgrounds. Mike told you some of, well, all you guys weren't there yesterday, but um, you know, Mike's background was retail banking uh, for a large uh, retail bank and mine was tech, uh, you know, software development. Um, really started it and uh, worked the early parts of my career on Wall Street, uh, you know, building trading systems for international banks um, and working with all kinds of mobile technology. Early on, we teamed up with Ed Cohn, who was your third speaker today. And, it, you know, I have to tell you, you know, you got the B team because <laughs> Ed is, uh, you know, the senior statesman amongst us. He, he is an amazing fella. Couldn't be here because he got sick. And so Mike stepped in. Mike's not the B team. I'm the B team. <laughs> but, you know, Ed is just would have been a tremendous uh, blessing for you to hear from. But uh, I know Mike will do a, a great job in his stead. Um, Ed mentored us through 20 years of business failure, success, and growth. And you might say, that's a little odd. Why do you start with failure? Well, all business is is 
failure repeated until you find success. <laughs> That's exactly what business is really all about. And you know, this, the road to success is paved with failure. And um, you know, you know, if someone looks at you and declares your success in business, it's usually because you've just failed more times than them. <laughs> and uh, so the key then, you know, with that principle is to learn not to die when you fail, because, um, you know, tomorrow's another day. And uh, if you can survive your failure and then learn to plan to survive the next failure, then you can progress. And so uh, that's a, a neat formula for success. Uh, and through Ed and his mentor, so our vision was to build, buy, and sell companies that glorified God. And that's what we tried to do in our individual business careers. And we hit the wall because while we saw biblical principles work in business, um, the organizations we work for were not uh, comfortable carrying those business principles as far as we wanted to carry them. They just say, well, you know, that's nice, but this isn't that God stuff. And so we got frustrated. We started Thompson Blackstone. We said, what would the Lord do if we didn't have any ceiling? And so that was the premise of Thompson Blackstone. And so we want to honor the Lord and how we operate those businesses. Um, and, and, and we tried to instill his principles and everything we did. And we teamed up with Ed Cohn and he mentored us and helped us to refine uh, those goals, but then ex helped us expand those goals into, well, what happens if the Lord blesses your business? And I'll challenge you guys with this right here and now as you're maybe getting started or thinking about getting started, uh, that you commit to being, you know, a godly steward uh, with, with what God does with your business. Um, we, um, in, in one of our businesses, became quite successful to the point where we actually needed to establish a foundation independently to, to deal with these funds. And um, when we sold that business, we were able to endow that foundation where it's self-sustaining. And so we, a couple times a month, we get together uh, at our offices, which is the home office of the Seed Foundation. And we get to do some really, really neat, cool things uh, that uh, help ministries around the world. And I could go on and on on that. But if you have questions about that, be happy to get into that. But today I have two kind of encouragements for you, uh, you know, as you look at starting your business uh, and 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 expanding in your careers. Um, number one is find a great mentor. Um, this, this, this is a, this, it's actually a little bit emotional, but you know, cause Ed was Michael and, and mine and um, you know, what we've learned from that man has been incredible. Um, I, you know, I'll just just walk through some of the, some of the benefits, some of the th key things that we've learned from him. So, so just so you know where we're going, my first one is find a great mentor. My second one is find a great business partner. And so we're going to to look at a couple things in, in those. In the, you you want to find someone who's good at business and you have access to. There's, there's tons of people who are good at business that you're not gonna have access to, but you had to find somebody who's willing to spend that time with you, which would be very key. And then you also have to make sure there's, there's some chemistry. You know, he might be good at business, he might be good at your business, but you just kinda, you know, when you sit together, it just doesn't gel. It, it really needs, it needs to gel, you know, in, in terms of, you know, having a mentor, just someone who understands you, just, you know, you have a good, you know, communication volley, if you will. And then there needs to be alignment, you know, alignment from a spiritual standpoint, 
as if you guys are in business and are believers, I would encourage you to um, first off even embrace the principle of scripture of uh, not yoking with unbelievers. Uh, and, and even with the, any strategic relationship you're doing, you know, you're, you're not going to be compatible with the world. So just get that out of your systems early on. And if, if the sooner you do it, the better, uh, because um, there'll, there'll be conflicts down the world, down the road, if, if, you, if you don't kind of embrace this principle or, or you'll find yourself going away from your Christian values. And then business-wise, you know, a mentor who actually can, you know, apply, uh, you know, some, some valuable insights. Um, you know, we had that little session over there. We were there with Paul and a group of uh, a couple of, uh, of our folks were, you know, in construction management. You know, I didn't have a lot to offer for that, you know. So, so Paul was, you know, really carried the day. That made sense because I know tech companies. I don't know how to buy concrete or, you know, shape wood. And so you need to find a mentor that is applicable to the space you're, you're in. There's some lessons we got from Ed. Actually, this first one comes from Ed's dad and just some of the, some of the things. I, you guys heard of Graco? Ed and his family are the founding family of Graco. It's the largest children's furnishing company in the world. Uh, they make pack and plays, prigs, you know, huge deal. Um, you'd never know it if you talk to any of those guys that it's as big a deal as it is. And I remember, and I didn't hear this from Ed. I actually heard it from some of his other employees, you know, a story about Ed's dad and, um, you know, humility. You know, they're running the plant, Graco, um, you know, critical operations, and something goes wrong. A pipe bursts outside. And it's this guy's first day. And so everybody clears the plant floor. Everybody's got shovels. They're outside digging to get to this hole. And the guy in his first day, he's sitting around, you know, you just watch. You guys are digging away. And the guy next to him is digging. He's, you know, I don't know if he's moved a shovel or dirt or not, or but the guy next to him is frantically digging. And he said, uh, yeah, so my first day. And the guy looks up. Yeah, nice. Glad, glad to see you're here. He's like, you know, do they treat you okay here? And he's digging away. Yeah, yeah, they, they treat me all right. <laughs> and he's still walking back and forth and just kind of loud. And, you know, they finally get the hole dug and they get the, uh, the, the, the hole patched up and the plant goes back online and, and the guy goes back in, you know, his first day and somebody pulls him aside and says, dude, come here, you know, you know who that was? in the hole with you while you were standing around on your, <laughs> leaning on your shovel. That was Mr. Cohn. Yeah, he owns the company. Now, I can tell you right now, if that were me, that guy would have known who I was. <laughs> and that would have been his last day. <laughs> but the graciousness and humility that was there, I mean, I know, I'm sure that went through his mind. You know, it's, it's his first day. And okay, give him a pass. Just gave him a pass. Just walked, didn't need any of that. Great lesson in humility. Um, prioritization. You know, Ed really helped me with this one. Um, you know, because when we first met Ed, I was still kind of crazy. Um, more in that DC mindset than DI, which I still hate. <laughs> And we were, I had worked on the Skycam as a contractor. We were pulled away from it. It was like kind of my life's work. And, I, you know, I wanted to get it back. And we were, Mike and I were pursuing this venture to acquire the Skycam um, uh, hostily, actually, because they didn't want to be bought. But um, so... <laughs> 
we, you know, but this is, this is, this is our personality. Mike's a lot like this too. We're, we're going to take them out. Right. <laughs> and so we had arranged for this clandestine meeting with 51% of the stockholders on a Saturday on site, you know, cause I was very familiar with the team and all because I helped engineer it. Um, and, and so we had this clandestine meeting set up on Saturday and Ed Cohn was going to come in and meet and, you know, we were going to have a, you know, meeting of the minds and, you know, take this thing over hostily. And, um, you know, a couple of days before Ed called me up and he said, cancel the meeting. We, okay. You know, I didn't know him that well at this point. And I'm like, is he crazy <laughs> in my mind? I didn't say that. It's like, you know, we, you know, it took a lot to organize. We can't just, you know, stop and, you know, and, you know, so I'm trying to be gentle. Well, is everything okay? And he says, yeah, it's okay. You know, I have to rake leaves. What? <laughs> I, I happen to know Ed just sold gray code to like, I think Rubbermaid, <laughs> you know, it's just a huge, you know, he's, I'm, he's certainly not, you know, needing of labor. I mean, you know, he wake his own late and I was just trying to be, you know, careful about how I, you know, question our, you know, financier. And, you know, and finally he says, actually, I don't have to rake leaves. He said, my sons have to rake leaves and I need to be there to make sure they do it right. <laughs> you know, I just, you know, could, but he had his priorities in order. And, you know, I would suggest this as a footprint for, you know, priorities in your life. But Ed demonstrated that to me and it was, it was so impactful. And I started to see, you know, and I, and I started to realize, you know, my version to get things done was to plow through it with abandon. And after I stopped allowing it to be all about me, we got so much more done. And, you know, we were able to invest in other people and, and things worked out much better than you making yourself, you know, the, you know, the clog in the, in, in the works, but God first, family second, service third, work last. And for me, work was the only one of those that came naturally. And so this was very helpful uh, to like protect those other things when, you know, work things, you know, came on my radar. And Ed was great in, in helping us to do that. <laughs> this is one I like, um, you know, personality with, with Ed was, you know, speak softly, quietly, and gently, but carry a big stick. <laughs> um, I would, Again, you didn't get a chance to meet Ed, but he's a very, you know, low key, calm sort of guy, but um, he does carry a big stick. Uh, one of the situations we were in, we were in this hostile tape. Well, actually, now we're, I can't even remember which it was, but we're trying to acquire the Skycam uh, organization. And we have a meeting with their ownership team. This is not the, this is the operating ownership team and um, at, at, at Ed's office and they show up late. They don't call and, you know, they came in the door with an attitude and you know, the whole time during the introduction, they're making rude comments. And, you know, we're all sitting around, standing around the conference table. And, you know, the president of, of the company, as we're sitting down, says something, you know, something rude. I don't even remember what it was. And we were in the motion of standing. And you would have thought there was a spring on Ed's seat because he sat down and stood up and he kicked him out. <laughs> He kicked them out of the office and, and said, you know, I, I've had enough and it's time for you to go. You know, you showed up late. You came here, you know, and he kicked them out. For like, what? 
but in another time, we were uh, we were called in uh, to meet with a very large corporation, a multi-billion-dollar corporation, who was trying to work in the software space that our little product was was working in. And uh, Ed came to that meeting with us, and he just said, I'm just going to be a fly on the wall. And we got in this meeting, and it was like a scene out of a movie. Um, we were meeting with the COO of this company. It was a woman by the name of Tommy White. She was about 6'4". <laughs> she had a coffee cup the size of a pitcher. And, you know, she's... First off, she showed up late, too. It was all, like, staged, and, you know, and we'd say, you know, is Miss White coming? You know, when Miss White comes, you know, you'll, you'll know. And, you know, just, just sit there and be quiet, and, you know, and, and she comes in, sits at the end of the table, is a big power play, and she begins to berate us. She's like, you little software company came in our space. Uh, we're going to take you out, and she starts threatening us, and she's, going on my eyes are like saucers because you know how are we going to take on a multi-billion dollar corporation and she's letting us have it and she's you know she says um you know i want you to give us a proposal to take your technology we're going to take it over and we're, we'll take it from here son you know kind of thing and you know we'll give you a fair price and all this but we want you out of this space like what and we're walking out, and she's still going at it. And Ed, Ed's walking next to me. He's very calm. Let her try. <laughs> Speak quietly, softly, but carry a big stick. And the next year, I mean, it was just like one of those biblical scenes where, you know, Gideon takes on the... <laughs> we tore them up. <laughs> Um, they they went with so they well first off they they made us do a proposal and he and says roll and write the proposal but don't send it to her until I see it until we send it to him he says I see you have training development and you know installation he said, training you know we had fifty thousand dollars he said change that seven million <laughs> you know implementation. Seven more million, <laughs> you know, delivery, seven million. Now send it to her. <laughs> so that's what we sent to her. And this infuriated this woman. And so, you know, she went out and engaged with one of our competitors and it was a disaster. And so our competitors were just not staged to do this. Um, and um, they ended up firing Tammy and begging us to come back in and talk to us. And then, so Mike goes back in and negotiates the deal of a lifetime. I mean, we had, you know, we had provisions in there that just, you know, and it was us and a multi-billion dollar corporation. And that deal today is still earning multi-million dollars for frontline organization, still in place today. They're about to lose that deal because some of the guys that used to work for us have started a competitor that's going to take them out because they're they're making the mistake of you know ignoring the little guy but uh, that's that's going to be interesting to watch play out so speak quietly softly and gently but carry a big stick And this is the biggest one I think uh, we learned from Ed is don't compromise your values no matter what. Um, I'll share uh, a story with you um, that Ed demonstrated this quality in, in a huge way. Um, we were operating the SkyCam. We had just completed our first trial season with uh, ESPN, and um, at the end of that season, um, ESPN Sunday Night Football was declared the number one sports broadcast on the planet, 
upseating for the first time ABC Monday Night Football. And one of the, I think it was Wall Street Journal or whatever, he said, and one of the main reasons was Skycam. It just added so much to the coverage. And so this, you know, infuriated ABC, who was doing the Super Bowl coming up. And so they got us on the phone and um, we said, we want Skycam at Super Bowl 39. And, you know, where's your contract? We put the contract there. They signed it and we were off. And so go do your thing. We want Skycam for ABC. And, you know, we told them about, well, we have these provisions um, that um, no alcohol or tobacco sponsor for Skycam. For sponsorship for the Skycam. If you do anything about Skycam early on, one of the ways that they would finance it is when they showed a shot from Skycam, they'd say, you know, this shot was brought to you by the Radio Shack Skycam, and you just, or it would be the, you know, Gatorade Skycam or, or whatever. And so we had to approve the advertiser, and that was in our contract, in our contract. You know, I don't know what your views are on alcohol, but, you know, one thing is clear in the Bible is that it's unwise. And I grew up in a house with an alcoholic dad, and there was just no way we were going to allow um, our product to be represented by an alcohol sponsor. And so the, the contract read so that, 48 hours before air, they had to disclose who the sponsor was. And so I called up, this is before Super Bowl 39, it's kind of a big event. I don't know if you've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I called up the executive producer's name is Fred Gadelli and said, hey, Fred, this is Roland. He said, what do you want, Roland? I, you know, I'm busy, you know, we can, we're, blah, 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 blah. You know, I was like, well, I need to know who the sponsor is for, for uh, the, the game. And he said, oh, yeah, oh, oh, it's going to be great. As soon as we switch from New York, we're coming up, we're opening up. It's going to be the Bud Cam, and, you know, we're going to open up. It's great. It's the Bud Cam, Sky Cam, da 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 And he's just rattling on and on and on. And I say, Freddie, you can't do the Bud Cam. He's like, what are you talking about? I said, you, we contractually, you can't do the Bud Cam. We, we, you know, there's no alcohol. Spot. He said, Roland, so... At this point, Freddie taught me, I'm from West Philly. Freddie taught me some words that I didn't even know. <laughs> and he went on a litany of profanity and all, and that ended with, you don't tell ABC who their sponsors are for the Super Bowl. Click. Bah. So there, there we are, right? So I call up Mike, I'm like, Mike, what are we going to do? <laughs> what are we going to do? Um, you know, we got to call Ed. All right, this is a big problem. And so call up Ed and explain to him the situation. Um, and he said, well, what do you believe? I said, well, I have a third grade Sunday school class, and I told them, you know, when you see it on, Sky, on TV, you're never going to see it with a alcohol and tobacco sponsorship. I was like, I really wouldn't want that to happen. But I'll be honest with you, in my own heart, I was defeated at this point, and I was ready to cave, kind of maybe how you felt, uh, Paul, when the guy wanted you to do the, the altar. Uh, I was, you know, just feeling real debating it. And, and Ed's reaction was, well, then just, you know, go fix it or pull it. I'm like, okay, all right. So, I, you know, I, I'm not calling Freddie back because that didn't go it. But I'm calling Freddie's boss. I called up to New York and got one of the high-level ABC executives, and I said, you know, we have a problem. He says, yeah. He says, yeah, I know. I said, well, you know, I talked to Freddie. He says, yeah, I've already talked to Freddie. <laughs> And I said, well, I contract, I said, I have a contract sitting right on my desk right now. I see, he says, I see that, and I see that that's a problem. Don't worry about it. We'll get it all fixed. I, really? And so he said, I'll call you back in two hours. 
And so I hang up from this, calls me back in two hours and said, don't worry about it, it's all done. I said, well, who's the sponsor? So we don't know yet. We'll figure it out. You know, don't worry about it. Just, just go with it. It's like, okay. It's like, call. We get in a conference call, me, Ed, and Michael. And <clears throat> I said to, to Ed, they, they said it's all fixed. And he said, well, do you believe them? I was like, no, sir, I don't. <laughs> I said, I, I think they're saying to themselves either – I have a lawsuit with the little dinky company in Malvern or one of my biggest sponsors I'm going to have a problem with. I choose A. He said, really? You think they're going to do that? He said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I happen to know this fact. So in the Skycam control panel, you have two monitors. One is what the Skycam is shooting. The other monitor is what's going to the satellite to the live air. And so when they're both the same, a little red light comes on means you're hot, don't screw up. <laughs> That's basically what it, what it means. And there's a six-second delay between what the world is seeing and what you're seeing. So um, if they violate our contract, I'm going to know about it before the rest of the world. And so if they violate... Here's the idea, Ed. We'll send bars to the truck. Do you know what bars are? They're little lines. They tune and sync up everything on that. It's like, oh, okay, let's, let me get this right. If they violate our contract for the opening of Super Bowl 39, you're going to send bars to the live feed. Yes, sir, that's what I'm proposing. <laughs> he said, well, how many viewers are there? I said, well, the latest estimate that there'll be 3.5 billion with a B worldwide viewers. And they violate, you're going to send bars to the live feed. I said, yes, sir, that's a proposal. He said, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. <laughs> and so. I was in San Diego at the time. I flew back. I am, we went to many Super Bowls. I really wasn't interested in being at this one, but I instructed the team exactly what to do. And I said, if you don't do exactly what I tell you, don't come to work tomorrow. Um, but if you see Budweiser on our screen, on our feed, you send bars to the truck. It's, it's over, your, you know, over your head. You need to do this. And honestly, today, I'm not sure. I don't want to give away the end of the story, so I'll say that. But because because it is, so I flew back to Pennsylvania, and Sunday, you know, I went to church during the Super Bowl, and my wife and I pressed record on the thing. And I'll be honest, I didn't hear anything that was said at church that day because you know my, my I went to church at a principal. Um, I was there. <laughs> But my mind was thinking about getting home and turning on that recording to see what actually did happen <laughs> or whether we were going to be famous for the rest of our lives for, you know, disrupting, you know, the biggest broadcast in, in television. Um, but we did, came home, and we flicked on the TV, and they said, we're switching to, you know, San Diego Live, and saw the sky cam view and said, welcome to Super Bowl 39. This view is brought to you by the Disa sky cam. And um, relief, you know, of course, you know, poured off of us. And um, Visa sponsored us for the next whatever number of years. And sky cam blew up. And it became what you guys all know it to be, which is, you know, a staple of professional football broadcast. It's probably doing the Iowa game now. Um, but we, we realized at that point, probably even before, that we need to get out of this. This is just, this is just too much of a conflict. You know, um, it's flying on Sunday when we're supposed to be at church. It's this, you know, all, all this thing. So we, we, we sold Skycam to an ESPN affiliate in 2004. But... There's a huge, huge lesson there about your value. Yeah. I didn't tell you at the 
point, at one point, and, you know, we had the conversation. She's, if you pull out the sky cam, what are the implications? So we're losing everything. We'll never work in the broadcast industry again if we. And Ed said, I don't care about that. He said, Ed, we just spent $5 million of your money engineering this prototype sky cam for this event. It's gone if we lose this or, or, or mess this up. And he didn't hesitate, not one millisecond. He said, I don't care about that. What do you believe? And that was a huge, 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 huge lesson for us. So those are four basic lessons we got from our mentor, and that's some of the value that you can get if, if you do the same. The second one, how's my time? 10 more minutes. Let's find a great partner. <laughs> no, but I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. If, if, it'll be tough for me to do this one without getting emotional. My business partner of 25 years is sitting here. You're going to hear from him later. He's the uh, smarter half of the Thompson and Blackstone duel. Um, but um, you need to find a partner that you can trust implicitly. You know, it needs to be someone that you can trust literally with your life because you can't be looking over your shoulder when you're doing startups. It's crazy. It's not for the light of heart. I think the human, human body can take about three. You're on number three. That's it, man. <laughs> you can't go beyond that because it's, it's taxing and you need to have someone you can trust implicitly. You also need to be able to align on spiritual values. Um, and it's not just, oh, he's a Christian, I'm a Christian. I so, so often hear that, it is so unwise. It's, it's not good enough to be a Christian. You have to be a like-minded Christian with similar values. Uh, because you're going into the trenches. And if he's shooting the gun this way and you're shooting the gun that way, you're going to kill each other before the enemy kills you. You need to align on strategic issues. Um, the Lord just gave Michael and I just an unnatural ability to gel. When we talk, we just... We just get it. I mean, you know, and you need to find that kind of um, I, I don't know what the word is, but just cohesiveness with with who you're working with and who you are pursuing, um, you know, a business with. Um, and, and you'll know when you find it. I I don't know that there's any formula for this, but. For us, I'd say this was God-given. I mean, we had a Jonathan and David-like respect for one another and love for one another that, you know, we just highly respect each other's thoughts and ideas. And um, it, it has to be there to be successful. You also need a compatible skill set. You know, another thing I see young entrepreneurs do, you know, they'll have a skill in a particular area and then they have their partner, which was their buddy from college, you know, who's a roommate in college. And, you know, well, what's he do? Well, he's, he's a cool guy. He's, what else can he do? He's, well, he's my best friend. Well, what else can he do? Well, you know, not really much. <laughs> That's not your guy. You need to find someone who has a compatible skill set to, to go down this road with. And once you do, you need to stay in your own lane. As one of these things that was remarkable to me about Michael is, you know, so, so first of all, the way we addressed it, we did something that most people don't do. We did, you know, co-presidencies. Uh, we were, called ourselves managing partners 
he dealt with sales, marketing, customer service. I did dealt with product operations and R and D. If I said something technically that this is the direction we we're going to go, Mike backed me 100 percent. You know, 100 percent. And you know, I did the same for him on a sales decision. You know, I contributed. He contributed. But, you know, if he said it, you know, we were doing it. And when I said, hey, I think there's a better way to deliver software, we ought to call it a subscription base or whatever, when the rest of the world was doing, you know, license-based software, he was like, great, let's do it. Totally backed me. Uh, and equally, and that actually turned out to be the whole SaaS model for delivering software. We had no idea but it took over how software did. But for that decision, there was probably a hundred other not so good ones. <laughs> but Mike always backed me. And, you know, if I said it, you know, you would have thought it was his idea. And, you know, he backed me 100% as, as I did for him uh, when he made a sales and marketing decision. You know, again, I said, you know, when, even when I made bad ones and, you know, I backed him, you know, even when, you know, he made bad ones. <laughs> so, you know, this was this was one of our early websites. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you've, you know, it's kind of based on the principle of, you know, that Seth Godin wrote a book called The Purple Cow. And so if you're driving down an Iowa road, and you see a bunch of cattle out there, and one of them's purple, you're going to stop. Well, this is our version of, you know, the orange website. <laughs> Wandering down the road <laughs> of, of uh, you know, website pastures, you're going to stop. <laughs> and this orange, and, you know, I particularly like our, uh, you know, our ring with the, you know, this was state of the art for, for back then. But, you know, if Mike said this is step one in our course to becoming a unicorn, that's step one. <laughs> well, I thought I'd have some fun with that. But on a more serious note, um, so kind of cool thing we had happened to us, um, you know, with Skycam, we won an Emmy. And um, I was, had the privilege of being able to deliver the acceptance speech. Mike and I had a plan that when they called us up to receive it, we would both go up. And um, when they called our names, you know, lights came on, you can't see anything. And I walked up and I ended up on the stage by myself. That's way that was his way of saying, you know, you got this. Although none of that was true. But I wanted to just share with you an excerpt of that speech um, that I think applies here to, to choosing a partner. I went on with a bunch of tech stuff, thanking this guy and that guy and all that stuff. And then I wrote. You know, there are many people I would like to thank. The list is too long to list them all. But first, I would like to thank my business partner, Michael Blackstone, who joined me on this platform, which he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Whose friendship and counsel and camaraderie has carried us through many difficult challenges. He's the type of person, if I said, let's go take apart an old rusty bicycle and build a spaceship and fly it to Mars next weekend, he'd say, who's driving? <laughs> in fact, he would say, really, there's no way in the world I'm going to let you drive that thing, so I'm driving. <laughs> <laughs> you see, that's the ultimate business partner, one who will drive off the cliff with you. Special thanks to Ed Cohn, whose guidance and financial support allowed us to chase a dream. I also want to thank Kenny Agard at CBS for never losing faith in us 
I want to thank John Gonzalez at NBC for his pioneering spirit and, and use of the SkyCam and a football coverage during NBC's Experimental Football League, which will remain nameless. I think the initials are XFL. <laughs> <laughs> to Jay Rothman, Chip Dean, and Paul DiPietro at ESPN for making SkyCam a key part of ESPN's NFL X and X game coverage. And a thank you to Tom Landsman for being the man who makes SkyCam a reality in the real world. To Garrett Brown for being a great mentor and inspiration for fostering a contagious spirit of excellence, not that any of us ever caught it, <laughs> uh, to, to our spouses for their relentless support, to my wife, Lisa, who I'd come in, beat it and battered, and she'd patch me back up like a match unit, say, go, go back out there and make that bird fly. And lastly, most importantly, thanks to God for his grace, enablement, and guiding hand in our lives, who has proved that his grace is sufficient to carry us through the trials of business. And for more importantly, having found his grace sufficient to carry them through the trials of life and death, as a gift to you, we would like to share with you the story of 9-11 heroes, Todd and Lisa Beamer, in the book entitled, Let's Roll, I hope you will enjoy it. And so we gave out 400 copies or something, ridiculous number of uh, Let's Roll filled with tracks. And so we got to witness, if you will, to that community of several hundred broadcasters in that. Uh, wow, I got through that. <laughs> um, I'm gonna pause there and uh, ask you guys, did you have any Questions or thoughts? Jared, is there something else you wanted to do? How about let's ask you some questions that Paul turned off with? Or is there a specific point where you didn't feel like winning? Or was it so I never felt like quitting. I often felt like dying. <laughs> <laughs> And yet I, I didn't bring it today, but I had a, a framed, my wife framed a note that I wrote to myself during one of those moments with Skycam where we were actually potentially delaying an NFL event because our rig was stuck on the field. And, you know, I wrote to myself and literally it wasn't good English. I want die, <laughs> you know contemplating the implications. If we can't get this thing to work, the, the truck is calling me on the, on the headset saying, get that thing out of there, you know? Um, so die many times, but never quit. Because like Michael, we, we loved what we did. We just, we just had so much fun and had so much fun doing it together. It was never, I, I, Mike, I don't ever remember, like, should we throw it in? Never. Die, yeah, but quit now. Okay, here's my question. So, as you have gone over the years, what are you looking for in a young member? Yeah, my, my answer would be very similar to Paul's on that one. Um, you know, we started out, um, you know, hiring for skills and then quickly moved into a hiring, hiring practice based on attitude. Um, and I'll talk about hiring and, you know, just how key it is. But if you're not really good at hiring, which we weren't, because we hired some duds over the years, I have to say, you better, better get good at firing. <laughs> Because if you don't, you're done. <laughs> um, and so we made some mistakes over the years, and, but you need to be able to have the fortitude to correct those mistakes. They will happen, even if you're good at hiring. Uh, I think we got better at Michael's definitely better at it than me. Uh, I hired some real doozies. Um, but you, you need to correct those mistakes. So, so we would look for attitude work ethic. Uh, we hired a lot of young believers 
um, who were like history majors and art majors who the parents told them, how are you going to get a job <laughs> history major, you know, unless you're going to teach in the school. But um, a lot of those kids were very bright and had great work ethics and attitudes. And so we were able to build and grow a, a lot of um, young talent that way. Yes, sir. I guess, like, practically, what does that look like? I mean, you're like, okay, I think you need to teach adults, so and now I'm going to some character, and then I can train them there, or is it like giving them more help and positions, building slots, but then you can grow into those positions? Yeah, there's a lot of different facets to that because, you know, when you're hiring, you have a need. And when you're small, you don't really have a lot of leftover bandwidth. And, you know, so they kind of have to work in, in that capacity right away. Um, but, and, and I don't know if there's any easy right answers to that. But one of the things we did was move people around a lot as you know, Paul described with, you know, even his GM, finding the right seat on the bus, Stephen Collins, um, a good to great, I think. Is it? Yeah. yeah. And um, that's key to, to find, you know, where people's natural talents are. And, and you might not get it right at first. Um, the other thing, you know, is interesting in the hiring process you know, when you're early on, you can't pay those high dollars for skilled positions. And it would not have been appropriate to do early on, but later on, it did become worth it to hire really skilled people in their positions. Um, but they also had to have that attitude. And that's, that takes a little bit more work to find that individual who fits in your culture and you know, is highly skilled at a position, but as you mature as an organization, you 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 want to maybe start to try to lean to focus there. But you, but definitely early on, focus more on the attitudinal aspect, and you can teach the rest. And you know, a lot of our kids are quick learners. You'd be surprised how fast they can learn. I mean, I my daughter, I, you know, she's doing some work for me in some of our real estate holdings. You know, I taught her accounting like that. I gave a couple of Udemy courses and she blew through it. And, you know, she's talking to me about accounting principles that I don't even know. <laughs> I was like, wow, she, you know, but she's of that generation. She, she got it, she gets it. And, you know, a lot of our kids are, are that way. And so you can gr use them and grow them. I don't know how, I hope that provides some insight there. Sure. I, uh, I had a guy who reached out to us who wanted a job in the cruise line. Pulls into this truck, across the front of this truck, the thing was same old AFS people. And he fits right in. I don't want to tell you what he did. He comes in, packs it all up, and uh, kind of a sloppy touch. I said, I'm sure it's not the And I asked him a simple question. I said, who will make you get this? He started telling about his kid who was a life class and he was And then I asked him, I said, what does that mean on your truck? And he told me that uh, he went to he was in jail for a little bit of time. He didn't go in looking for a job, but while he was in, he said he had experience with God and uh, he was changed and became a person on the inside. And that was his way of explaining his truck. And uh, to what I hired that guy, he was he was he just and uh, so exterior mm, that's it. Yeah. A good human touch. And then he asked me some questions like, what would that mean on From an HR Amen to that. <laughs> Mike, you have any thoughts? I'm sure your mind was racing doing that. I have one story. I think that might be helpful for us. But we made the decision to really hire young people. Just come old now. 
comes in and he said, so I, so I said to him, I said, so, you know, what have you been doing, you know, the last couple of days? He really didn't have a resume. Um, I said, so what have you been doing? And uh, he's looking at a shoe. I mean, he's not even looking at me in the face. I mean, he's like, well, you know, I've been, I've been doing some stuff and, and you know, I, I'm just trying to make a, a change. You know? And I was like, well, you know, I'm trying to lighten the situation up a little bit. You know, there's so many people in jail. <laughs> No, 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 nothing like that. And, and I said, well, what have you been doing, dude? You know, it's, it's okay. It's, it's, you know, it's okay. And he literally put his head down. He goes, I'm a nothing cows. And I said, you've been nothing cows. <laughs> and he said, yes, sir. I'm a cows. I said, get up. Get up. Come on. And I said, yeah. said, well, come on. I told him, walk down to the director of HR in our director of HR's department. I said, Sat him down and I said, This is Colleen Duan. She's the head of our HR. Give this guy a job. I don't care what his salary is. <laughs> Hire him. Yeah. And she did. That's farming. I was a farmer. I know how farmers are. Dairy farmer. Dairy farmer. That. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was one of our sharpest, worked the hardest, took over one of our products. And about seven years into it, he came back to me and said, He decided to hire her. In fact, he hired her. Supposed to be rolling my executive secretary. She never became that. She was always off doing something else. She was such a gifted executive assistant. An amazing, amazing lady. Still did shorthand. I did a call one time with seven lawyers in seven different states. And myself, she's sitting there on the phone, no face time, or whatever. But anyway, we hire all these young guys, and uh, she called it Wapa Room. Uh,
in person, in business person, and that is God is all of your life. It's a little anecdote. There's something about these farming guys. They just, they just connect on a different level that I don't understand. <laughs> you know, I'm from West Philly, and it's funny. You know, Mike and I have our office now. We built an office on it. It's a 25-acre plot, and so it's beautiful and beautiful fields around the office. And Mike says to me, he says, I want to buy a tractor. You, you, you game with that? What? Knock yourself out, man. <laughs> you might buy a tractor, that's cool. And so Mike buys the tractor and you know, he's out there plowing the fields. You know, I'm, I'm just, you know, like, he's going back. He comes in after a while, he's like, he's all excited, he's great, you know. I don't want to hog all the time. Do you want do you want do you want a chance? It's like no, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's out back there. He, 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 and he is, he is happy as a clam. And I don't know what it is. And he's right about the work ethic of these guys. And, you know, but <laughs> it's a different kind of something. <laughs>